Good morning, and welcome back to this series of tutorials on SimTalk. In the previous video, we saw what control structures are in programming, and we defined two classes, conditional and iterative. In today's video, we will see the second type and how working with iterations can help us solve problems by simplifying our code. Let's start by looking at the simplest one, the while structure. With this structure, we can execute a command or a set of commands constantly as long as a condition is met. If at any time it were not met, it would exit the loop. However, we must be very careful to specify conditions that are not always met, since otherwise the method would enter an infinite loop and the simulation would collapse. Let's see how to apply this in an example. Let's imagine that at the beginning of our simulation, we want to fill a buffer with parts. Therefore, in our init method, we will use the create function to create parts inside the buffer and fill it. If we weren't using iterative structures, the only way to do this would be to look by hand at what the capacity of our buffer is, in our case, eight pieces, and then run the create command eight times, like this. Apart from not being very efficient, this code is very inflexible, since if we change the capacity of the buffer, we would also have to change the method's code. However, we can apply the while control structure to simplify it. With this change, we are telling the method that, as long as this condition is met, create parts within the buffer. And in the condition, we are comparing two attributes of the buffer. On the one hand, the number of parts it contains, and on the other hand, its capacity. Therefore, with this loop, we will create parts in the buffer until the number of parts is equal to its capacity, that is, until it is full. By doing so, in addition to greatly simplifying the code, we make it flexible to changes in the buffer capacity. Another of the iterative control structures that SimTalk offers us is repeat until, which works in a very similar way to the while loop. Let's apply it to this example to see it. In both cases, we are filling the parts buffer, but we change the time at which the condition is checked. In the while loop, if the condition is never met, we would never execute the command, while with the repeat until loop, we will always execute it at least once, since the condition is evaluated at the end. However, there is still an iterative control structure that we have not seen that is somewhat different from these two. I am referring to the for next structure. In this structure, we can indicate exactly how many iterations we want to do without having to depend on conditions. To do this, we will have to declare an integer variable that will act as a counter and indicate an initial and final value. This is very useful when we want to take advantage of that counter to make calculations within the code. Furthermore, with a forward and next loop, we prevent infinite loops from occurring, as could occur with the previous two cases. Let's see this with another example. Let's imagine that now we have several buffers that we want to fill at the beginning of our simulation, each with its own capacity. A solution could be to copy the loop that we have already declared in the previous step and repeat it as many times as we have buffers, changing the path of the buffer to which we refer each time. However, this is not the most efficient solution nor the most flexible. Instead, what we can do is list, in an object type column of a table, all the buffers that we want to fill. Having this, we can greatly simplify the code by using the for next structure. We will start by executing a loop as many times as there are rows in the table. To do this, as we have mentioned before, we will need a variable that acts as a counter. This must necessarily be a local variable of type integer, but we can name it whatever we want, although normally by convention, the letter i is used. On the other hand, we can declare the variable outside the loop or inside it. If we do it inside, the variable will cease to exist as soon as the loop ends, even if we have not finished the method. Since it is an auxiliary variable, it usually pays to do it this way. So we're going to use this strategy for our example. Thus, we are telling the method to execute a loop, starting with the counter in one, and with each iteration to increment it in one until it reaches the value of the edim attribute of the table, which is always equivalent to the number of occupied rows. Furthermore, by writing var just before the variable i, we are indicating that we want it to create this variable only within the loop. Now we just need to write what we want to execute. We are going to reuse the loop that we already had defined for a single buffer and modify it as follows. What we are doing is changing the path of the buffer object that we will fill with each iteration. Let's set a breakpoint and run the model to see it better. As we can see, before entering the loop, we only have the buffer variable defined, and plant simulation automatically creates the counter variable i right when we enter the loop.
Then we save the path to one of the buffers by accessing a cell in the table. Since the counter is just a local variable, we can use it to define which row we want to measure, in this case, row 1. So we save the path to the first buffer. Now in the loop, it will generate parts in that buffer until its capacity is full. When the repeat until loop finishes, we will move on to the next iteration of the for next loop. So now we have automatically increased the counter to 2. Therefore, when we save the path to the buffer, it will now be pointing to the second row of the table and therefore to the second buffer. This way we will change the buffer as the counter progresses until we reach the last row of the table. If we want to advance the execution to a specific row of the table and we do not want to manually execute all the rows until we get there, we can use conditional breakpoints. For example, let's imagine that we want to go to the last iteration of the for next loop. We define a breakpoint within the loop and then we right-click on it and select Breakpoint Settings or Control plus B. Here we can configure various parameters of the breakpoint. For instance, if we want to deactivate it or not take it into account until a certain time in the simulation is reached. But what interests us is the last section where we can define activation conditions. If we only want the debugger to appear in the last iteration, we can write the following condition. If we save the changes and execute the method, we see that the debugger only appears when the counter is exactly 10, which is the last row of the table. This is very useful when we want to understand why an error occurs and need to stop the execution of a method under specific conditions. Finally, we will see two functions closely related to all iterative control structures. The first one is the continue function, which allows us to skip a step in the loop execution. And the second is the exit loop function, which allows us to exit the loop early. Let's see them with another example. In this case, one of the buffers already has parts. We want to fill only those that are empty. One way to achieve this would be to include the following command at the beginning of the loop. Every time we evaluate a new buffer, we will check if it already has parts by consulting the occupied attribute. If this returns true, it means that it already has parts, so we can move on to the next row of the table. Now we also want to limit the total number of parts that we create at the beginning of the simulation to 20. That is, if we have already created 20 parts, we want to stop the loop. We can do this using another local variable as a parts counter and with the exit loop function. Let's run the code and see how it works. Every time we create a part, we add one to the num parts counter. When it reaches 20, we execute the exit loop function and exit the loop, even though the repeat until condition is not met. Now it will continue iterating for the rest of the buffers in the list, but since the counter has already reached 20, in none of them, it will create more parts. However, it is not very efficient to continue executing the code, even knowing that it will be of no use. To avoid this, we can add to both the continue and the exit loop the number of loops we want it to apply to. By simply putting a 2 after the exit loop, we are telling it to exit both the repeat until loop and the for next loop. Let's set the breakpoint and restart to check it. As you can see, when it reaches the exit loop, the execution exits both loops and ends the method, just as we want it. With this last example, we have already seen the main iterative control structures, how they can help us simplify our code, and how we can combine them with the conditional structures that we saw in the previous video. In the next video, we will see how we can make our models even more modular using parameterization. Greetings, and until the next video.